To show that x is a positive real number for every real argument x, uh, we will split this into cases. Of course, we can easily see that by, just by definition, if we insert a real number, we get a real number out, so we know that x is real. But um, this is, of course, not enough. Uh, and the two cases, we first of all assume that the number is non-negative. That is the easy part, because in this case, we know that, uh, so if this holds, then e to the x is, of course, uh, the same, uh, so by definition, uh, this is this series, and we see that the sum for n equal to zero is just one always, and so this is one plus uh, the sum uh, of n going to one, from one to infinity of x to the power of n divided by n factorial, and of course if x is non-negative, these guys here are all non-negative, and so this is a sum of something non-negative, so of course this whole thing is bigger than zero, so we know this is bigger than one, or equal to one, which is bigger than zero. Uh, hence, x uh, of x in zero to plus infinity for all uh, x in, sorry, x in zero to plus infinity. Okay. Now, if x is negative, then uh, we need a nice little trick, which is just from our properties of the uh, exponential function. So if x is a negative real number, so we're somewhere in this interval, uh, then we've seen x of x is the same as 1 over x of minus x. This is basically something we've seen before, that the inverse of this is x to the minus x, and so this, the multiplicative inverse is this, and so we get this uh, identity here. So this uh, is the case by, yeah, by, uh, sorry, by theorem, uh, sorry, I hope you can still read it, 299c. That was where we, where we seen this. Okay, this holds, but now since this is a negative number, minus x is a positive number, so we know that uh, so this is bigger than zero, and so we've already seen here that this is bigger than zero, and so its reciproc is also bigger than zero. So this is bigger than zero, and so we're done. So this, uh, yeah, so x, x is in zero to plus infinity for all x in R. Now, part two, uh, part B. So we want to study this real exponential function. First of all, x, R, as I've already said, is well defined by part A, which is now proven, and uh, continuous since x itself is continuous, and since this is just a restriction, uh, continuous. Okay, now we need to show that it's strictly monotonically increasing. So for this purpose, we let x and y be two real numbers with x smaller than y, and need to show that x of x is smaller than x of y. Okay, now it's time to use our miraculous equation again, namely uh, x of y is of course the same as x of y minus x times x of y, uh, x of x, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, oh, sorry, I'm, sorry, I skipped one step. Uh, you can put this together, uh, sorry, let me, introduce this intermediate step. Uh, this is x of y minus x plus x, so just subtracting and adding here, just artificially. And now to, for this plus here, I can use this, my miracle equation. So this is equation E, um, x of y minus x times x of x. Okay, now I know, I want to show the inequality between x of y and x of x, so I need to understand what this thing here is. So x of y minus x. And there it's also easy to see, since uh, x is smaller than y, this means that y minus x is positive. We know that x of y minus x, this is the same, same argument as above, like one plus some from one to infinity x, uh, sorry, y minus x to the power of n divided by n factorial. And since this is a positive number, we know that every summand is indeed positive, strictly bigger than zero, so this is really strictly bigger than one. So this means, uh, applying this to this equation, x of y is bigger than x of x, since this is just one or bigger. 
So this means we've shown what we wanted to show. XR is strictly monotonically increasing. And as we have discussed in section 3.2, I think, um, we know that every strictly monotonic function is especially injective. OK. Um, so it's strictly monotonic increasing. It's injective. So all that remains to show is that it's surjective. And there we can use basically a standard argument that we've already used before, namely uh, the intermediate value theorem. Um, so we need to show that every, uh, so it's surjective. So we need to show that uh, for every y in 0 to plus infinity, which is the codomain of the function, there I can find some x which is mapped onto this y. And so and this is now very easy to see. Namely, we've seen in this uh, theorem with the limits, which is yeah, not here anymore. So that was theorem 365. We know especially that was kind of we had these powers involved with some exponent n. And if we choose this exponent n as 0, we get some result about uh, the exponential function itself. Namely, by this we get that the limit of x going to plus infinity of x r, now using this new notation of x, is plus infinity, and the limit of x going to minus infinity x r of x is zero. Which means, if I am somewhere in zero to plus infinity, I can always find some smaller number and a bigger number, which are taken as values, because here this means I get infinitely uh, in, sorry, infinitesimally small numbers, so to say, so very, very small numbers, arbitrarily small numbers, that's what I wanted to say, arbitrarily small numbers as values of x, and this means I get arbitrarily big numbers here. So, um, yeah, by, uh, yeah, so since this holds, uh, hence, uh, there exists some numbers since, uh, yeah, y1, y2 in, uh, sorry, x1, x2 in r, ah, yes. uh, x1, x2 in r, such that x of x1, uh, sorry, with, uh, with x1 smaller than x2, since we, for minus infinity we go to zero, and here we go to uh, plus infinity, such that x of x1 is smaller than or equal to y, and this is smaller than or equal to x of uh, x2. Right? So in between two values of the function, but then this is really the uh, standard application of the intermediate value theorem. Then we know that everything in between is also uh, taken. So the intermediate value theorem says that in between these numbers there exists some xi in the interval from x1 to x2 with x of xi uh, equal to y. So y lies in the image as well. So this means x of r, so if we take everything, we get everything in the codomain. Uh, and so this means that x is surjective, and so it for, uh, x r is surjective, and so x r is bijective. This is what we wanted to show. Okay, so we've seen that there is a, uh, oops. yeah, we've seen that this function so now has a nice behavior, and since it's bijective, it has an inverse function, and this is now the logarithm that you probably all know from high school. Um, okay, this is bijectivity, and so the inverse function we now define as the logarithm. Definition. Three sixty-eight, and the function is called the natural logarithm. We shall see logarithms, uh, other logarithms, very soon. The natural logarithm is given by uh, log. Uh, and this we define as the inverse of x r. So the inverse map of this, I just note it by log. And this is now taking the codomain of x r to the domain of x r. So it's going from 0 to plus infinity to r. Uh, yeah. Uh, and sometimes this might be uh, 
more convenient for you. The other notation that is used for this logarithm that you also may use uh, is ln of x instead of log x. So ln logarithmus natural, I don't know Latin. Anyway, so natural logarithm ln. Okay, so you may also use this notation if you prefer it. Um, okay, so what do we already know? We know that this inverse of a continuous function on an interval, so we know that it's continuous. This is what we've already proven. And we know that since x is strictly monotonically increasing, that log is doing the same. So this was all part of theorem 323 about the continuity of inverse functions. So log is a continuous and strictly monotonically increasing since x bar has this property. Strictly monotonically increasing. Okay, we've already seen in this notorious theorem 299 the computational rules for the exponential function and they have some nice consequences because there we get computational rules for logarithms as well. And these I want to summarize in one big theorem and then yeah, prove it all in one go. Namely, first thing is very elementary uh, and just keep in mind the logarithm of one is zero and the logarithm of e of the yeah, Euler number is one. Okay, if I would get a euro for every time I've seen log one is one in some exam of a student, I think I would be a rich man. So this is some very common mistake, so please pay attention to these, uh, yeah, to this kind of, it's easily, uh, your mind is playing tricks at this point easily. Okay, by this miracle equation I call it e, um, this has a consequence for logarithms as well, namely there, this does the opposite thing. Um, the log of x times y is log x plus log y for all x and y in the domain 0 to plus infinity. So I said that x is good because it converts addition into multiplication and so this is basically the analogous thing. Log converts multiplication into addition, just the other way around. So this is not very surprising from this point of view. Okay, um, C log of the inverse of x is minus log of x for all x in 0 to plus infinity. This is also the opposite behavior of x. Um, and d, um, and this is now something which is a very important observation, uh, if we take some positive number uh, a uh, and if we have a rational number q, then we get an interesting property, namely uh, the exponential function of q times the logarithm of a, if you compute this, this is nothing but a to the power of q. So this is a power of square roots or something, so as we've seen before. So this is the standard cost of powers. This is now reconstructed completely. So for every exponent q, we can reconstruct this power just by using the logarithm, so the inverse of exp, basically, and exp itself. So exp has really control over all powers here, and this is, um, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> so just, yeah, this is um, the way to go. Okay, uh, let me just prove A right here because this really fits in one line. Um, the only thing we need, because this is an inverse for exp, it's clear that we've seen before, exp of zero is one, and exp of one, this is just defined as E. Uh, so if we just apply log to both sides, we have it. So that's everything, there's nothing to show. Okay, for the other properties, let me erase. Okay, the proofs of the following parts, uh, we basically need to just uh, employ the corresponding properties of x in a smart way. Um, meaning the following. Um, so we take two arbitrary numbers, uh, x and y in zero to plus infinity. Okay, and uh, we get that exp of the right hand side of what we want to show, exp of log x plus log y. Now, this is a wonderful situation for our miracle equation. x turns addition into multiplication. So by applying e, this is the same as exp of log x times exp of log y. But since this is log and x by inverse to each other, this is just x times y. Okay, but we know, first of all, uh, 
this, we see that this becomes then x times y, but we also know that x of log of x times y is x times y, simply by definition of the inverse. And we know, that's what we've seen uh, simply because, yeah, these inverse exist and so on, that xr is injective. So if two, uh, two arguments, log x times y and log x plus log y, are mapped onto the same thing, they have to coincide. So this shows that log of x times y is log x plus log y. Done. Right? So just using the injectivity of x here in a, uh, this very prominent point. And C, we do the same thing. Let x be in 0 to plus infinity. Here we use uh, not the miracle equation, but the theorem 299 C. Uh, namely, x of minus log x. There we've seen that x of minus is, uh, gives back the inverse, so that this is the same as x of the argument without the minus, so just log x, and this thing to minus 1, and again, x and log are inverse, so this is x minus 1. Okay, uh, and now, obviously, x of log of x minus 1 is x minus 1. Uh, it follows again by the injectivity here that this guy has to coincide with this guy. So since this holds, claim follows S and B. Uh, B. Okay, and finally, D, uh, I want to skip this proof, although this is non-trivial, but this is basically, uh, we did this for the case uh, A equal to E, uh, namely, that was part of theorem 299. There we've seen that the exponential function itself has this property without this additional factor of log A. Um, so here it follows completely analogously. Shown completely, I mean, this proof is really non-trivial, so you need some induction in there and so on, but we've already seen this. So this is shown completely analogously to uh, theorem, uh, sorry, theorem, 299.e, so this was the case a equal to e. But you can just copy the same argument and you will find out uh, just, if you take, a, uh, sorry, not 229, 299. Uh, if, we, if you take a look at this argument there, you really will see that this goes through line by line. Okay, just grab some new chalk up here. Okay, um, so yeah, this this completes the proof of this logarithm property. So we see that logarithm also has some nice properties, but I'm, yeah, of course, they are all basically followed from the properties of exp. Um, now, we've seen, so part D, uh, just to, so um, we've seen that, oh, sorry, let me, uh, just think about how to explain this in which order. Um, so we've seen uh, that for, a uh, in zero to plus infinity, and some rational exponent, we've seen that A to the power of x is uh, the same as x of x times log A. That was the part D that I just did. So this was the case for all rational functions. Uh, for, sorry, for all rational exponents x. Now, the simple idea behind powers with more general exponents is to say, okay, Let's generalize this, because this expression here on the right-hand side, this is well defined for any x. This is, uh, we can throw any complex number in here, so that this doesn't matter. So this really generalizes the definition of a power. So the exponential function in this way kind of incorporates all powers, and this is what we will use. Namely, we just make this definition for a in, in zero to infinity, and for any complex exponents, we just define a to the x, which is now some complex number. We define this like this. So we just generalize the previous observation, right? So this again means that the exponential function is kind of in charge of all powers that we can imagine. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of the, the, the amazing thing about the exponential function because this is so non-obvious. I mean, powers are only, I mean, what, what's a power? A power is just a product of some element with itself. So this involves just standard multiplication and we can just get all exponents and so on if we just, yeah, fill this in one big, one big function just gets them all. And this is kind of still, I find this still fascinating to this day. So this is really how we define powers with arbitrary exponents. 
which might still be a bit weird, but you somehow get used to it. <laughs> okay, so this, this is now our general definition of powers. And now you might say, okay, you can define powers in this way for any exponent, but um, we know for rational exponents, so just the standard powers, they have nice properties, these power laws, basically. So about how the exponents behave with multiplication and so on. And the amazing thing is, um, everything transfers. So we get the nice properties um, that I will summarize in the following theorem. So 371, we take A and B to positive real numbers. Okay, I'll just note one thing that's also a common mistake in some exams, that um, it's important that the base number here, this A, in this general construction is always a positive number because otherwise this is simply not well defined. Here we need the logarithm of A. So there's no way of defining uh, something from negative number to the X for general X, it just doesn't exist. So this doesn't work. As we've already seen for roots, there's not, no roots of negative numbers in general. Um, okay, so much for that. So that's A and B be two positive numbers. First of all, uh, A to the zero should, is one. Okay, this basically follows from the previous theorem, but I wanna show this, uh, yeah, in this uh, situation, uh, can show this explicitly. This is very trivial to see. B, A, to the exponent x plus y is a to the power of x times a to the power of y for all x and y and c. So this is nice, this is good news. And this, this theorem is somehow like a relief because you can see there's a general fancy way of computing power, uh, of defining powers, but we can compute with them just as we want and just as we are used to. Then if we take one over a to the power of x, this is actually really the same as a to minus x, which we also want to have. So, and this also holds for all x and c. Ha, ah, beautiful. Um, okay, let me continue here because it's only short uh, claims that I need to stay, uh, kind of, um, formulate here. D, a times b taken to the power of x is the same as a to the x times b to the power of x for all x and c. Another equation that's very familiar to us. E, um, this is just a logarithm law. Log of uh, a to the power of x is the same as x times log a for all x in, uh, so now we have to uh, restrict to, uh, sorry, uh, yes, x and r, because otherwise the logarithm is not very defined. If it's some power a to the x, we know that it's a positive number, so there the logarithm will be defined, but if x was some arbitrary complex number, this doesn't make sense. And uh, finally, oops, f a to the x taken to the y is the same as a to the x times y for all x and y uh, in r. Again. So here we also need to be a bit careful with the exponents as we shall see because the problem is, um, so this actually, uh, I think y can also be in c, but here it's important that a to the x is a positive real number, otherwise this is not well defined. Okay, so a lot of nice little equations and a lot of nice little proofs because this is really not that hard. Okay, proof. So part A, I just basically included this to see that we have all nice properties of powers combined. Actually, we've already seen this. Namely, uh, A. A to the power of zero, this is just x to the power, uh, x of zero times log A, which is of course x of zero and this is one as we know. Okay, that was trivial. Now, for part B, we just need to make some fancy computation. A to the power of x plus y. If we write this down, this is x of x plus y times log A. Okay, now by distributivity, this is the same as x of x times log A plus y times log a, and now it's time for our favorite equation again, because here we have an addition. So by our wonderful equation e, this is the same as x of x times log a times x of y times log a, and now by definition, this is a to the power of x times a to the power of y. And this is what we wanted to show. So it all goes back to these properties of x. Okay, um, part C, one over a to the power of x, what is this? This is, uh, just by construction, 
exp, so 1 over a is the same as a minus 1, so this is the same as exp of x times log of a minus 1. But we've already seen in the previous uh, theorem that, um, where do we have it? Um, here. Here it's still in there. So we've seen that log of an inverse is uh, log of x minus 1 is minus log x. So this is the same. So this is theorem 369 uh, part c. This is the same as x of minus x times log a, if we just put the minus in front. And this is by definition nothing but a to the minus x, which we wanted to show. Nice, right? So all these computations are very simple. And uh, yeah, it doesn't disappoint us, it goes on like this. Um, so a b to the power of x. Again, we write this down. This is the same as x of x times log of a times b. And there we've seen, that was part b of this theorem, I think. Yeah, here it's uh, still on the board. So log of a product is the sum of the logs. So this is x of x times log a plus log b. And of course, we can now use distributivity again. Whoops. So this is the same as x of x times log a plus x, uh, sorry, plus x times log b. And now equation e is kicking in again, so another miracle happening here. So this is x, uh, x of x times log a times x of x times log b. And yeah, okay, now I've got no space anymore. Uh, this is a to the x times b to the x, just by definition. Sorry for the squeezing here, but this is really just a standard argument. So again, we needed our miracle equation. Okay, now e. Uh, so we have it here. So the, this logarithm rule, and we use the same approach as here. We apply x to these things and then see that, uh, that it works. Namely, um, it's clear that uh, x of log of a to the x. This is, of course, by definition, just a to the x, which is defined as x of x times log a. So, and again, x is injective, so these two have to coincide. So here, the real exponential function x r injective, hence uh, log of a to the power of x has to be the same as this here, as x times log a. Okay, almost there. Uh, last thing we need to show, f uh, a to the power of x times y, uh, so, uh, no, sorry, do I want to stop with this? Uh, I think I want to, yeah, no, let me go the other way around. So a to the x to the power of y. So now x and y are positive real numbers. So let's, what is this? Um, this is by definition x of y times the log of this. So of log of a to the x. Okay, but we've just shown that log of a to the x is the same as x times log a. So we can directly apply the equation we just shown and get that this is x of y x times log a, and of course commutativity here, so this is the same as a to the y x or a to the x y. And this completes the proof. So basically we've just used this miracle equation there and yeah, proved and proved and proved. And so this is just an explicit computation here. Okay, um, yeah, let me maybe, yeah, this, um, yeah, I think I can, um, okay. Um, we have now something that I haven't mentioned yet and I formulate this in the combination of theorem and definition because I will not prove everything because it's proven line by line by what I've done before. And you want logarithms with uh, a general base, so you, uh, to a general base. You know them from school probably. Namely, for a bigger than zero, we can do the same uh, construction as before. Instead of doing the real exponential function, we now take a function which goes uh, from r to zero to infinity. And we just take f a of x as a to the power of x. So this is almost the same as x, but simply by multiplying the argument of x with the factor of log a. So yeah, this is just 
x, yeah, no, let me don't write this, doesn't, not readable. So the a to the x, so this is again well defined because this is really, in fact, that's the exp of a real number. So this is a positive real number as a result. Um, so, and in the same way as before for x and so on, we get that this is continuous, uh, strictly monotonically increasing. There we can also copy the proof. Increasing and bijective. Okay, and the inverse of this function. So it's inverse. Uh, and this is what we denote by log to the base a, so log with an index a. This is defined as the inverse function of f a going from zero to plus infinity to r um, is called the logarithm to base a. Uh, okay, let me squeeze the final thing right in here. Log a is continuous and it holds that log a of x is the same as log x divided by log a for all x in r. This final equation is the only thing that is not uh, as something we did before. This is something you again need to see if you apply x to both sides, you will get the same result. So if, uh, so if you apply x to, to this and to this, you will get the same thing. And so this, um, yeah, you can use the same argument as before. So um, this theory is basically the explanation why we don't use logarithms to argument uh, to the arbitrary basis mostly because there is only one logarithm essentially. This is just log of x multiplied to some constant number. So we just multiply log by some positive number, but of course everything interesting about functions like continuity and later on differentiability and so on, this doesn't matter if we multiply with a constant or not. So uh, actually there is only one logarithm. So, so to say. And so we will mostly only discuss log x and not use these arbitrary bases, but of course for practical computations, there these uh, arbitrary bases occur. And another sudden room change. Sorry about that. I miscalculated some time constraints. So I have to finish the last, the very last bit here in this lecture hall again. Okay, so we've seen now logarithms to arbitrary base. And uh, I just want to summarize two things about them in a remark. Uh, so remark 373. Okay, first of all, this is what I've already mentioned orally uh, and what was the consequence of the previous theorem. Any logarithm differs from the natural logarithm from log, which is the same in this new notation with base as the logarithm to base e where e is then, again, the Euler number x of 1. Okay, from x1, uh, only by uh, multiplication with a constant. And you can then see that the, uh, some properties of logarithm also generalize to this case, uh, namely, so to, to general logarithms, namely theorems, uh, theorem, 369b and c, which was kind of that log turns products into sums uh, and logs of uh, minus and so on. So these, uh, sorry, logs of inverses. So uh, these properties, if you just take a look at the proof for the standard logarithm, you can do the same uh, with the logarithm to arbitrary base. It's the same proof, so there's nothing to show. Uh, just you need to replace x by this function a to the power of x. Uh, but in general, this, this just goes through, uh, yeah, so these uh, generalize. Okay, uh, second thing I want to remark is something uh, that there's a particular logarithm that's important in physics. Uh, so since I'm talking to physicists, I can at least mention some physics in this course. Uh, in physics, whoops, I can't write physics anymore, sorry. Physics, oh, Jesus, okay. Uh, if you have two quantities, uh, so some say some positive numbers, positive quantities like, I don't know, values that you measured or something, uh, quantities, uh, quantities, so, okay, A, B, 
in 0 to plus infinity, and you have like two measured values, something, or two quantities that you want to compare. Um, there's a, if you want to compare two of these numbers, usually you're interested in kind of how many digits are they apart. Like if, is, is this 100, this 1000 or something? So it only, it kind of you, you ask the question like, uh, if you write a number as some, some number times 10 to a power of n, and the other one is 10 to the power of m, what's the difference between this m and n? So you have the vague order of these numbers, so kind of how, how they are scaled, these numbers. And um, they're kind of, this means like for example, uh, if you want to compare them, if there's some number, such that a is b times 10 to the n, if you're in this situation, uh, then you're of course interested in this number n. And so this, this then is a logarithm, because if you just divide everything by b and then take logarithm to base 10, you will get this number n. So uh, yeah, if, let's just erase this. And so uh, in general, uh, you can say, so it's very vague, it's not really a definition, I think in physics you have to be more precise, but what you need is the, logarithm to base 10 of the quotient a divided by b. And so this, uh, you also call this the order of magnitude, uh, order of magnitude, uh, that a is bigger or smaller, is uh, bigger or smaller than b. So this term will for sure pop up at some point uh, in your physics classes. And so this is kind of uh, where the logarithm kicks in, where you really need to need, need the logarithm to formulate this properly. OK, uh, this reminds me of a very stupid joke I want to tell. Um, physicist walks into a bar, and uh, the barkeeper asks him, what can I get you? And the, bar uh, the physicist says, I want to order 10 times more drinks than everyone else in this room. And the barkeeper says, wow, that's an order of magnitude. No. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, back to math. Uh, so, finally, I want to. Uh, so, this, these are not logarithms to arbitrary base, and I will, won't discuss them any further because of this reason. So, it doesn't really differ that much. Uh, they don't really differ that much from this natural logarithm that we studied. So, we will mostly see the natural logarithm in this lecture. And uh, the last thing I want to do in this section is to investigate limits uh, related to logarithms. So how uh, we have seen limits of the exponential functions, and we want to see something. Uh, so what happens to logarithms as well? So uh, three different results here. So first of all, we take the limit of the logarithm itself, and there we can easily see that the limit of x, uh, like from positive number going down to zero, of log of x is minus infinity, and if we go to plus infinity with log x we get uh, plus infinity as the limit. So as a oh, improper limit, to be precise. Sorry, I think my microphone was somewhere hiding in my shirt. I hope it's, yeah. OK, sorry if the quality wasn't all right. Um, OK, so much for that. And uh, part B is now also involving logarithms. And we want to investigate limits of powers and to see that also this generalized definition of powers, um, that's what we would expect from a power, namely. Um, so for all positive exponents, s in 0 to plus infinity, um, the limit as we go down to 0 with x of x to the power of s, we know that for uh, rational numbers, we would get 0. And it turns out this is the case for general s here as well. And if we go to infinity, uh, we know that for roots and powers and so on, we always go to infinity. And so this happens here as well. So limit of x to the s is, again, plus infinity. So again, improper limits, to be precise. OK, finally, um, part c. If we go to plus infinity and consider the limit of log x divided by x to the power of s, this is always 0 for all positive exponents s in 0 to plus infinity. OK, and this means basically if we compare the growth of log to infinity, we know that log goes to infinity if it's the log itself. We know that these powers go to plus infinity, but if we kind of compare them, uh, the denominator here wins. So uh, very roughly, the logarithm grows slower to plus infinity than every power. So all the powers grow faster. That's, that's here kind of an interpretation. I will also form, uh, or write this down later. But first, let's prove this statement. OK, the first part is basically very simple. 
um, you don't need to know very much or not don't need to yeah employ very uh, lot of stuff sorry sometimes some of this microphones making a mess today um, so first of all we know that log is going from zero to plus infinity to R and we have seen that it's uh, continuous uh, uh, sorry yeah continuous that it's bijective just by construction and we've seen that it's strictly monotonically increasing And if we know these properties, uh, which we already have shown, uh, then it's clear that this has to go to infinity if we go to plus infinity here and to minus infinity if we go there. There's just no other cho choice. This holds true kind of for every strictly monotonous function here. So uh, yeah, I won't go, uh, won't elaborate upon that. Um, okay, so this this already shows part A. So this already implies the claim. Now, concerning powers, it's a little more effort. Mm. So we use the sequence criterion. Um, we take a sequence uh, in zero to infinity in this, so a sequence of positive numbers, and we want to assume that this diverges to infinity. So to check the, uh, yeah, the, the second, uh, sorry. Mm. What was that? Okay. Uh, not, not to infinity to zero, sorry, to check the first limit, we want that the limit of xn is zero. Okay, now, um, we want to, of course, we want to see what happens with xn to the power of s for just some general sequence, and then we can use the sequence criterion for uh, limits of functions. But um, here we first know if we go to zero, um, we've just seen that if we go to zero inside of log x, we will go to minus infinity. So, using now the sequence criterion the other way around, so using this and then uh, putting the sequence in, we uh, can derive directly from A that uh, the limit of n going to infinity of s times log xn. So s is just a constant positive number, so this doesn't change very much, so we know that this goes to minus infinity, and so this goes to minus infinity as well. So, this means... Uh, that if we now consider the limit of n to infinity of uh, xn to the power of s, this is by definition the limit of n to infinity of x of s times log uh, xn. And now this is a sequence which goes to minus infinity. And we've already seen what x does if we go to minus infinity. So this is then the same because this is some arbitrary sequence, so it doesn't, the structure here doesn't matter, only this is really important. This is then the limit of x going to minus infinity of e to the power of x, and this is what we've already computed. This is by theorem uh, 360, um, I can't read my own handwriting, it's a 5 or a 7, I'm sorry, no, it has to be, um, yeah. Uh, 65 or 67, <laughs> so 60 something, uh, this limit is zero. So where we computed the limit, sorry about that. Okay, so since this holds for every sequence which goes to zero, this implies then that uh, in the post theorem 349, uh, that the limit of x going to zero of x to the power of s is zero. Okay, this is good, so this shows the first limit. Okay, and the other limit uh, is basically shown analogously. Um, I won't go into detail on that, so basically we also take, again, the same, but this time we take a sequence xn, uh, which diverges to plus infinity. Uh, then we get that this sequence here diverges to plus infinity, and then we can use the same argument here to know, because here we know that this diverges to plus infinity, so in the end it diverges to plus infinity. Right, so I don't write this down again, so other limit analogously. Uh, just using the same argument here. Okay, um, now for part C. Uh, so we, this time we have divergence to plus infinity. So this time we again consider some sequence diverging to plus infinity and use the sequence criterion again. Uh, so that now xn, n in n, be a sequence in zero to plus infinity, which diverges to plus infinity. So with limit 
n to infinity x n is plus infinity. So um, then, first of all, by a, so now this is basically the same argument uh, that also I just mentioned verbally for this other limit here. So by a, we then know that the limit of n to infinity of s times log x n is plus infinity. And so uh, now we want to use this, and we want to use this for the quotient that's written down there, and uh, namely in the following way. Um, we have, if we ins insert the sequence into this quotient, we have the quotient of log xn to xn to the power of s. This is the same as, uh, and now let me just add artificially 1 over s times s log xn. And uh, the denominator is the same as x of uh, s times log xn. Um, yes, OK, so this is for all n and n. OK, now I uh, run out of space, so I'll take the next blackboard because it's not that much to do anymore. This holds for all n and n. And we know that this goes to plus infinity. So here we have some sequence diverging to plus infinity, which is on itself in the numerator, and it's an argument of exponent denominator. So we can say, uh, or we can argue now, because of the sequence criterion, that uh, the limit of uh, n to infinity of log xn divided by xn to the power of s is the same as 1 over s. This is just some constant number times uh, the limit of y going to plus infinity uh, of y divided by e to the power of y. So assuming that this limit exists, but this we will see uh, in a bit. So we have seen that, uh, yeah, just replacing, because this is just some sequence diverging plus infinity, so we really get this, that this is the same as this limit. But uh, since we've seen that, e, uh, that the other limit, so the reciproque here, e to the y divided by y, that this goes to infinity. So e to the y grows faster to infinity than uh, every uh, than, than every power. So this is a special case, and we've seen also in the proof of theorem 365, uh, yes, so this as in the proof of theorem 365, we have seen that, uh, <coughs> sorry, we've seen that um, the, this is the reciproque of something of some function converging to uh, diverging to plus infinity, and the same as for sequences, we can see then that the reciprocs will always converge to zero. So this is just as for yeah, if a sequence goes to plus infinity, one over the sequence goes to zero, and um, yeah, this is what we get here. So this really shows. So uh, yeah, this this is for some arbitrary sequence. We started off with some arbitrary x n, and this shows then that uh, yeah, limit. Oh, I've already made this box here. It's a bit early. Uh, this shows that the limit of x going to plus infinity of log x divided by x to the s is 0. And this is what we wanted to show. OK, so this is the, uh, yeah, the, the final result. And let me just add a remark about these uh, limits. So first thing is what I already mentioned. Uh, first thing, uh, so loosely speaking, this last sequence, so part, uh, this last limit, so part C of the theorem uh, I just proved. Uh, so by theorem 374.C, uh, um, the logarithm log x grows slower to plus infinity. Again, I put this in quotation marks. Grows slower to plus infinity. Uh, then every power, then every power of the form x to the s, where s is some positive number. So logarithms go very slow, and this is also a useful observation to compute some limits sometimes. Okay, uh, yeah, s, sorry, s x goes to plus infinity, of course. So in particular, uh, we see that logarithm, log, uh, log, the logarithm grows slower than every root function, because if s is 1 over n, for some n, we get the nth root in here. And so we've seen this as a special case. Secondly, uh, 
just something, some convention I want to employ. Then the first of all, we have uh, defined these general powers only for positive numbers in the base. We will slightly extend this. Namely, uh, we've seen uh, here that this goes to zero. Uh, uh, if, we, if x goes to zero, we have a limit zero. And so we can just extend our definition. So motivated. Uh, by theorem 374.b, we just define 0 to the power of s as 0 for all s in 0 to plus infinity, which then means that the power can be continuously extended to uh, the interval 0 to infinity, including 0. So this is just for convenience. So this might pop up in some of the computations that are to follow. But this we already knew for n and n. And so this, uh, or where we could define this. And so here, we can now generalize this to every positive exponent. OK, so in this section, we focused on the exponential function for real uh, inputs. Um, in the next section, which is then the final section of this chapter on functions and continuity, we will more consider on uh, we will consider com the exponential function on purely imaginary numbers, meaning function, uh, numbers of the form i times y or some y in R. So, um, and, and these functions e to the i times something, we will see that they are closely related to trigonometry, namely to the functions sine and cosine. And actually, from high school, you know they are defined via angles and triangles and so on. Here we will exactly formally define them by using this exponential function as definition. Uh, and I will say a few words about how this is related to elementary geometry and triangles a bit uh, in the next section. So you will see, but now we will learn about some new interesting functions. See you in the next video.